This Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Russ Miller and is entitled, What Happened to the Dinosaurs? For a free catalog of hundreds of awesome Bible studies available on DVD video and audio CD, call Compass at 800-977-2177 or download and watch now at our website, compass.org. This being a Sunday morning, this is actually one of our Sunday morning messages we share in churches, and I call it Noah's Ark and Dinosaurs. You know, the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture. Well, that means word for word and cover to cover. It actually makes being a believer extremely easy. You read God's Word and you put your faith in the Word of God. Now, it seems like it should be really easy, right? But today, Satan and his minions throw out so many stumbling blocks, it actually makes it quite a challenge for some people. The first five words of the Bible are, in the beginning, God created. Now, you see those first five words under relentless attack today, don't you? I mean, they're right in Satan's crosshairs. Because if Satan or his minions can get you to doubt the first five words of the Bible, why read any further? Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. Now, today, a lot of folks in the church wanted to just ignore what Moses had to say. They want to stay away from biblical creation. Here's the problem with that. All day long, our public schools and colleges are teaching our children and grandchildren they evolved without God as a scientific fact, when actually those are two religious beliefs. Millions of years is a belief. Darwinism is a belief. Those are two religious beliefs. Um, I speak on college campuses, and the professors used to help me out by giving the kids extra credit to come there and harass me. It was awesome. It'd fill up the auditorium, and then I could slaughter Darwinism for them. Uh, they stopped doing that. In fact, the last time I spoke at a college, one uh, biology teacher quit her job the following Monday, said, I'll never teach the fairy tale of Darwinism again. She had to resign. God's good. She became a Christian and now teaches science in a Christian school in Arizona. See, real science is your best friend. But going back to this, Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. And Moses lays down the foundation for the gospel message in the first and the third chapters of the book of Genesis. You know, if you're going to build a building, a structure like this building right here, the first thing you have to do is lay down a solid foundation to build upon, right? Otherwise, what you build will eventually collapse if there's not a foundation. Well, God, through the inspired writings of Moses, does the same thing in Genesis 1 and 3. He lays down the foundation for the gospel message. And this is, again, why you see creation under relentless assault today. So you can't just ignore the issue. When churches ignore the issue, it's not a neutral position because the other side's teaching our kids and, and people every day. You've just surrendered. You're not neutral, you have surrendered. So I want to show you we can win and we would win the debate easily. Real science is your best friend. So let's look at what I call the, the cost, the foundation of the gospel message laid down in Genesis 1 and 3. This is where, through the writings of Moses, we're told that God gave us a perfect creation. Perfect. No death, no suffering. Perfect. Quite honestly, beyond our comprehension. Because we live in a world full of death and suffering. I mean, one of the biggest questions scoffers will ask a young Christian to plant seeds of doubt in their mind is, where is your loving God? Don't you have this loving God that knows and cares about all of us? Knows the numbers of hairs on your head? Which is easier for some people than others, by the way. <laughs> and, and that child's going to say, yeah, that's our loving God. And they're going to point to the death and suffering in the world and say, where is your loving God? And if that child doesn't know the biblical answer, they will be one of the great majority of kids that leave the church by the age of 20. Well, so where's the biblical answer? Well, it's right there in, in Genesis. The answer is God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. What in the world happened to it? Adam's original sin. See, Adam's sin is what allowed death and suffering to enter. And there's the biblical reason that we live in a world full of death and suffering, although we have a loving God. Now, that original sin, though, is much more important from a Christian standpoint. Remember, Adam walked in the garden with God. Why don't we walk in the garden with God today? 
Well, that original sin separated us from God, requiring Jesus' death on the cross to redeem us with him. There's the foundation of the gospel message. Creation, original sin, the separation, and the need for redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, our God is so loving that despite our sin, which is rebellion against him, despite our rejection of God through our sin, he still sent his only begotten son to suffer and die in our place. You can't get much more loving than that, can you? Now, Moses also told us that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Well, that would be a global flood. I mean, come on, a, a global flood? Secular geology says there was never a global flood. Well, you know, if the Bible were true, and I mean, there really been a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, a worldwide flood. I mean, the evidence should be overwhelming. There should be nothing to even talk about or debate on the issue if God's word were true. I mean, what would you expect to find? I, I would think if God's word were, you know, actually true, and there had been a global flood, I'd expect the outer crust of the earth that we live on and walk on will be made up primarily of sedimentary layers laid down by water, stratified out by the moving water, just like a, a miner with a pan scoops up sediments and water, sloshes it back and forth, and the moving water stratifies out and separates the sediments by grain size, grain weight, and density. So you'd have all sandstone, all shale, all mudstone layers making up the crust of the earth. And those layers laid down quickly in that year-long flood would be full of billions of things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I mean, if God's word were true, the evidence would be overwhelming. There would be nothing to even talk about. So, I mean, what do we actually find today? Well, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. So you have all sandstone, all shale, all mudstone, etc., full of billions of dead things that we call fossils, things that were buried so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> have you ever heard that the global flood's a non-essential? Most Christians don't even talk about the global flood. Let me point something out. This is the whole linchpin in the war of worldviews. It's the entire linchpin, and we don't even hardly talk about it. Let me explain why. Jesus said that if you don't believe Moses' writings, how should you believe Jesus? Why is it important to believe Moses' writings? We see the secular or the humanistic worldview, which is taught as if it were science in our schools, has been for 53 years now. It's based on the thing about this. It's based on the exact same sedimentary layers laid down by water. It's their whole foundation. They just say, hey, wait a minute. Those layers separated by grain size, weight, and density by moving water didn't form in a flood. No, no, they form slowly over millions and billions of years of time as you slowly evolved without God. And they teach these two religious beliefs as if they were science. Not science, they're religious beliefs. Um, I speak in colleges and the professors give those kids extra credit. I'll walk up to the podium and man, they're just glaring at me with hatred. It's, it's really odd because I'm just there to help them. Why would they hate the fact I'm going to give them another opinion? It's, it's really satanic almost. But they're just glaring at me and God showed me how to do this. I'd start out by saying, hey, uh, before I start, I want to ask you all some questions. How many of you have been taught that creation is a religious belief? Oh man, they raise their hands. They're going to let me get away with any religious teachings, boy. I say, okay, it is. It's a belief on how we came about. Hey, let me ask you another question. How many of you have been taught that Darwinian evolution is science? Oh man, they raise their hands. They're there to defend science, boy. And I say, well, you know, now I'm kind of confused. Um, because aren't creation and evolution the same thing? And they all look confused, like many of you do right now. <laughs> and I say, aren't they both beliefs on how we came about? And all of a sudden, the glares melt, and it's like, uh, hey, wait a minute. They are both beliefs on how we came about. How come we're being taught this one is science? Because humanists own the system, and they teach their religious beliefs as if they were science. And what they've done is they've undermined science and scientific education and the faith of billions of people. See, what they're actually teaching by teaching that we came along by billions of years of death and suffering as kids. There was no creator. There was no perfect creation corrupted by some original sin that separated you from some supposed creator. 
And that means there's no need of redemption. This has been taught as if it were science for 53 years. Have you ever heard that if you don't believe in their religious belief, millions of years, and or Darwinism, you're anti-science? You ever hear something along those lines? You know, real science is your best friend. That's all bluff and bluster. Don't, don't listen to that stuff. Did you know of the 200 or so branches of modern science, over 80% were started by Christians to study God's creation? Now, yes, that's been undermined by sacralists over the last 150 years. But think about this. We kicked creation and prayer out of our schools in 1963, 53 years ago. Think about this on a timeline. From the 1600s through the 1700s, through the 1800s, all the way through 1962, we taught our children creation and had daily prayer to God. And in 1962, our nation was number one in the world in science, number one in the world in math, number one in the world in engineering, number one in the world in education, number one in the world in economy, number one in the world in manufacturing, number one in the world in military power, number one in the world in standard of living, number one in the... Well, you get the picture. Then in 1963, we kicked creation and prayer out of our schools. We turned our back on God as a nation. Now here we are 53 years later. How are we doing? Read Romans 1, 15 through 30 today. It'll take you two minutes. And you'll see what God allows to ha happen to a nation he has blessed if they turn their back on him. It will blow you away. If you say, where's God in all this? He's right there where he said he would be. See, it's, Darwinists and atheists understand this teaching very well. This is from the editor of American Atheist magazine. If there was never an original sin, there's no need of salvation. No sin, no separation. No separation, no need for redemption. And he said that puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. And he's absolutely right. I agree with that statement 100%. If there was no original sin separating us from God, there's no point of redemption. And this has been taught as if it were science now for 53 years. If you ever wonder, what in the world's happened to America? Well, there's your answer right there. And if the age of the earth is an issue for you, and it is for about 70% of Christians, I cover this very well in our Old Earth Global Flood teaching. I show folks how the five pillars of Old Earth beliefs are radiometric dating, showing how they work so you understand why they don't work, uh, Grand Canyon, dinosaurs, the geologic column, which is that drawing of layers, that's really where the old earth beliefs come from, and the belief there was never a global flood. And I explained Pangaea, continental drift, the Ice Age, many things that only fit a world that has endured a global flood. You know, in 2 Peter in the New Testament, we're told about that flood, that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. There were eight people on board the ark. Noah, his wife, three sons, and three daughter-in-laws. Four couples on the ark. Which is interesting because National Geographic did a study on the human genome and came to the conclusion all humans come from one of four distinct gene pools. Well, I hope they didn't spend a whole lot of money on their testing because we, they could have just read the book of Genesis and figured that out, right? See, real science is your best friend. If a scientific finding goes against the Word of God, it's not the fact, it's the interpretation of the fact. Take those sedimentary layers laid down by water. They say they form slowly over millions of years of death and suffering. No, I say the sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water were laid down by uh, <clears throat> water. You know, if you started with four couples about 4,500 years ago, and if they averaged 2.2 children per couple, we would have 7 billion people on earth today. Since the study say we have 7 billion people on earth today. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, come on, Russ. If there really been a global flood, wouldn't there be flood legends all over the world floating about us? Well, you know, there's more than 300 ancient flood legends that have been discovered. Almost every ancient civilization starts off on account of a few people surviving a flood and repopulating the world. Now, they're not all exactly the same as the Bible story because at the Tower of Babel, people spread out and they handed it down generation to generation and some changes took place. But if you want to see the original and true account, it's right there in the book of Genesis. You can look at it any time you want. So how did Noah and his family <clears throat> collect all those animals from all over the globe? Well, I think if God, and we don't really know how much time God gave Noah to 
to uh, build the ark. A lot of people say 120 years. It probably wasn't exactly that, but let's use that as a figure. Let's say you had 120 years to collect these animals. There's a lot more than eight of us here. I don't think we could do it today, and we have airplanes and boats and all sorts of things they didn't have. So how did Noah and his family do it? Well, they didn't. God had the animals come to Noah. Two of every sort shall come to thee. Seven of the clean types. Science News reported that all sheep come from one of four ancestral ewes. Well, let's say there were seven sheep on the ark. Let's say two rams and five ewes. And when they got off the ark, they sacrificed a ram and a ewe. That means we start out with four ewes, right? So that would certainly fit the biblical worldview. Okay, another fair question. How did Noah and his family fit those millions of animals on board the ark? Well, let's get a feel for about how many animals might have been on board that ark with Noah and his family. You know, the Bible indicates he only had to bring land dwellers that breathe through their nostrils. So fish and water-dwelling mammals like whales and porpoises wouldn't be on the ark. Amphibians may have been on the ark, but they didn't have to be on the ark. We don't know. Gets rid of a lot of issues. But the most important phrase is this. He only had to bring two of every kind, not two of every variety of a kind. This is a very important phrase for Christians to understand. See, for the last 53 years, we've been teaching our children and grandchildren, Earth is thought, believed, belief, to have formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock, and oceans formed as it rained on the rock for millions of years of time. Now, of course, nobody saw any of that take place. I have Darwinists come up to me and atheists all the time. They get right in my face. They say, oh, you believe your invisible God created the world. I look them right back in the eye and say, you think we evolved from a wet rock. <laughs> you should try it. Takes the wind right out of their sails. Here's what they will do. They will stutter backwards and regroup and say, you're, you're making fun of our position. And just say, no, I don't want to make fun of your position. I just want to make sure you understand what you think you believe. You believe in the Big Bang, right? And they'll say, yes. Don't get into which one. They've all been debunked. <clears throat> you believe in the Big Bang, right? Yes. And after billions of years, a big rock formed, right? Yeah. And it rained on the rock for millions of years, right? Yeah. Well, you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock with no life on it. Where do you think we came from? And they'll go, wow, I do believe we came from a wet rock. (laughs) And what you've just done is prepare the soil for the planting of the seed. Because they've been taught that was science. They never really thought about how ridiculous a story it is. You know, in in Exodus 20, verse 11, we're told, For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the seas, and all that in them is. Do you think that's really important to God? This is in the middle of the Ten Commandments, etched into stone by God's very own finger. I think he knew this would be the primary attack on his word in the last days. Ten times in the book of Genesis, ten times we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And today, after millions of scientific observations, the only thing that is ever seen is that kinds only bring forth after their kind. Never has a single viable example of Darwinian macro change been found. This is why if you talk to a biology professor, they will not define the word evolution. Hey, now, in in real science and engineering, don't we break things down to the millionth of a degree? But in biology and college, they refuse to define the word evolution. Why? Because if you define the terms everyone would see there's no examples of Darwinian macroevolution to show anybody. Never have been, never will be. It's a scientific impossibility. I'll explain that in just a second, but Noah didn't have to take all 350 or so pairs of dogs on the ark. He only had to bring a pair, a male and a female, and they would bring forth after their kind to the sorting or loss of the parent's gene pool. So he brought the canines that had the full gene pool, and through the sorting or loss, it's called gene depletion, you get the variations within the kind, but only within the kind. One kind can only produce its own kind. If you took um, a pair of dogs, you went down to the pound today, and you got a couple of mutts, they work best, they have the widest gene pool, and you start breeding dogs and taking puppies with traits you like, after 100 years, you might end up with all the dogs we have on earth today. How many non-dogs would you get? Cats, pine trees, porpoises, how many? (laughs) Now you laugh, yet that's what we teach in school. We teach that that happens, given the magic ingredient, which is what? 
millions of years of time, time beyond human comprehension. And that's one more reason we should not compromise with millions of years of beliefs. Why hand them the victory? They've got no evidence of millions of years. It's a belief. Why not just stand firm on the global flood, which explains how the earth strata layers form quickly, wiping out every old earth belief. Hmm. So you've probably seen a lot of these uh, frauds. Have you ever heard you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Proving we're close relatives to the chimps. You ever hear that one? They, yeah. Now, real science, a believer's best friend, I've seen studies in Nature magazine that have a 30% difference. Why do they still say there's only a 2% difference? Why don't they get rid of the frauds and bring in the real evidence for Darwinism? Oh, have I mentioned they don't have any? I mean, I show people in, in this teaching, Science and Darwinism, how to scientifically destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Scientifically. Would you like to hear that? Yes. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Stop your watch. Oh, I'm sorry, that was three seconds. <laughs> See, this is the reason there's no evidence of Darwinian change. It never happens. Real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no viable way for nature to add appreciable amounts of new and beneficial genetic information to a gene pool. So I always say to them, if you think we started out as a paramecium or bacteria or whatever single cell creature you want to believe in, and there's no way for science to, uh, you know, for nature to add new and beneficial genetic information that's needed, how, how did we go from a bacteria cell to a biology professor? It's impossible. <laughs> it's, it's a total impossibility. That's the reason they have no evidence. So back to Noah's Ark. You know, we can only speculate on this, and I've seen a lot of different numbers, but about how many creatures were on the ark? Well, we have about 2 million classified species today. Only about 40,000 of those are vertebrates. If you take out the marine creatures and amphibians who were probably not on the ark, you take out the water-dwelling mammals who would not have been on the ark, you're left with about 3,000 kinds, two of each kind, about 6,000. Throw in seven of the clean creatures, you're looking at somewhere between six and 7,000 animals on board the ark. And the average size of a land dweller that breathes through his nostrils is the size of a house cat. So the question becomes, how did Noah and his family get 7,000 or so house cat-sized creatures on board the ark? <clears throat> I'm going to speculate here that of the few large types, like elephants, giraffes, and a handful of large dinosaurs, God probably brought young ones. They were smaller, they lived longer to reproduce when they got off the ark. Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. Am I saying dinosaurs were on the ark with Noah and his family just a few thousand years ago? Well, you know, the Bible says he was to bring two of every kind, which would mean dinosaurs were on the ark. Hmm. Honestly, how many of you believe, honestly, that dinosaurs and man lived together in the last few thousand years? Yeah, I'd say that's about 90% of you have your hands up. Now, usually when I speak in a church, it's about five out of 100 people raise their hand to that, okay? 95%, they've never heard this information. I guarantee you, a lot of you attend churches where the people in your church know none of this information exists. It's a sad situation. But the Bible tells us that man and beast were both made on day six. That would mean man and dinosaur lived at the same time, and the Bible's either true or the Bible's not true. It's that simple. So what's the first line we read in a dinosaur book to our kids and grandkids? The very first sentence, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. You just taught that child death and suffering existed prior to man. Hmm. Later on, you try to tell that same child by one man, sin entered the world and death by man's sin. And they're scratching their heads going, wait a minute, mom, wait a minute, granddad. You've been reading me books that say death and suffering existed for hundreds of millions of years before man came along. See the stumbling block? Subtle, yet devastating. Yeah, Pat Robertson said, there's no way it's possible man and dinosaur live together. We have skeletons of dinosaurs that go back 65 million years. Based on what? The geologic column and where they put them in the column. Based on a religious belief, a pagan belief. Now, this isn't just Pat's problem. 90% of Christian seminaries teach old earth beliefs now that put death before Adam. Their grads have filled the church. That's the reason only 2% of churches would allow me to show this information to folks. So how do dinosaurs fit into the biblical world, a biblical worldview? So let's look at some information. Now, before I get into this, 
let's be honest with ourselves. If dinosaurs had been gone 65 million years before man came along, there will be no evidence of man and dinosaur living at the same time whatsoever, correct? You know, first of all, the word dinosaur was only invented about 175 years ago. Prior to that, they were called dragons and serpents. Now, if you look at a dictionary today under the word dragon, you'll be told mythical creature. Here's a dictionary just 70 years old. Dragon, now rare. A huge serpent. A fabulous animal. Nothing mythical about them if you go back uh, just a few years in dictionaries. You know, the ancient history books are full of thousands of various accounts of man and dragons. You know, the dragon, we call them dragon stories today, but a lot of the uh, descriptions sound a lot like what we call dinosaurs today. Let me give you a couple of examples of what come out of what is now India. You've heard of Alexander the Great. When his soldiers conquered that area 2,300 years ago, he wrote that they were scared by the great dragons that lived there 2,300 years ago. 1,900 years ago, Polonius of Tana wrote the whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. It takes a big critter to kill and eat an elephant, right? We don't have such creatures today. Something different existed 1,900 years ago. Think about this logically. We find man-made carvings and drawings of dinosaurs all over the world. And we're told they were made anywhere on a timeline from 700 to 2,000 years ago, okay? Well, think about this. We didn't discover dinosaur bones until 195 years ago. If we didn't recognize dinosaur bones until 195 years ago, how do people all over the world know what they look like 700 to 2,000 years ago? <laughs> Somebody had to see them, right? It's the only thing that makes any sense. A few years ago in New Mexico, they found this cave drawing of a hadrosaur. Those are duck-billed dinosaurs. There are several duck types of duck-billed dinosaurs. They all had these odd crests on their heads. This one's a parasaurolophus. Notice that big crest coming off the top of his head. Well, the Darwinists were scoffing at this because whoever drew it, and they said it was drawn about 1,200 years ago, drew it striped like a zebra. And they said, well, there's no way they knew what it looked like because they'd been gone 65 million years. <laughs> then a few years ago in South Dakota, they found a mummified duckbill dinosaur. The skin was preserved, it was mummified, and it was striped like a zebra. <laughs> Somebody had to see them, right? But don't tell these guys in Monterey, California, about 90 years ago, that no one's ever seen a dinosaur. This creature washed up, it was seen fighting with seals the day before in the bay. It washed up dead on the beach the next morning. It had a 20-foot long neck. And the scientists there said, it looks like a plesiosaur. But it can't be a plesiosaur because they've been gone 65 million years when they're sitting there staring at the thing. That's what indoctrination will do to you, by the way. And you guys may know this, but uh, in the last 15 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found that still contain red blood cells, amino acids, soft, flexible dinosaur tissue. Last year, they found dinosaur DNA in some of those remains. You see, all these biological materials couldn't last more than a few thousand years at the most. You see, all those sedimentary layers laid down by water, they were laid down by water. And God's word, my friend, is true, word for word, and cover to cover. But people say to me, well, the word dinosaur is not found in the Bible. Well, the word dinosaur was only invented 175 years ago, but dragons and serpents are mentioned 20 plus times. I think God's describing a dinosaur here. See what you think. He tells Job, behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, we we're both made on day six, he eats grass like an ox. Well, some well-meaning theologians who have accepted the secular atheist belief of millions of years of time try to explain that away. Well, maybe that's an elephant or a hippo. Well, let's read further. His strengths are in his loins and belly. Strong loins and belly. Elephants and hippos, they do have big, strong bellies. Maybe that is behemoth, one of those. This guy's got a big, strong belly. <laughs> now, scientifically, you have to look at all possibilities, right? But what about this guy? He has strengths in his loins and belly because he had to balance that long, heavy uh, neck and head and that long, heavy tail. Reading further, he moves his tail like a cedar. Well, that's not a tail like a cedar. <laughs> cedar stump, perhaps. But there is a tail that's like a cedar tree. 
I think God's describing a, a, a seropod, the largest of his created kinds. And I think God deserves the credit for his creation. Well, I think we need to recapture dinosaurs from Satan, who's using them to mislead not millions, but billions of people into doubting God's word from the youngest age. We need to recapture dinosaurs for the glory of God. So how many of you agree with the overwhelming scientific, biological, geological, and archaeological evidence and the word of God that man and dinosaurs lived together in the recent past? How many of you can believe that? Absolutely. And it's important to learn to stand on the word of God. Well, wait a minute, though. The Bible talks about Leviathan. A flame goes out of his mouth. Fire-breathing creatures. You know, if a kid goes off to college and he can't viably ex- give a viable explanation for this, good scoffer is going to come up and say, hey, you don't believe in fire-breathing animals, do you? Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Well, let's go to Job 41. Let me show you where your God says there were fire-breathing creatures like Leviathan. You know, since we don't have any fire-breathing creatures to test, study, and observe, can we come up with a viable theory to explain them? Now, Dwayne Gish came up with this years ago, but this is the bombardier beetle. Now, when he's threatened, he sprays an attacker with a chemical that is the boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. He was designed with two chambers that store these volatile chemicals apart from one another because if they came together and touched, kaboom, that'd have been the end of the bombardier beetle, which is a problem for evolution, but that's another issue we'll we're not going to get into right now. But when he's threatened, the chemicals go from the storage chambers to a combustion tube where enzymes are added, causing oxidation to take place, producing a chemical that is the boiling point of water, and he can spray this and hit an attacker right between the eyes with boiling chemicals. He does this in about one one-hundredth of a second. How long does it take you to boil water? <laughs> Talk about awesome biblical design, right? So what in the world does that have to do with fire-breathing creatures? Well, what about this as a theory? Let's go back to Parasaurolophus. You know, the the duck-billed dinosaur that was found striped like the zebra? Notice that huge crest on top of his head. It was filled with a series of complex passages, tubes, and chambers. Oh, there's about a thousand theories on what it was from a from a trumpet it used in the mating season to a sword it used to fight other dinosaurs to a big olfactory, a big nose system it had. Um... But perhaps these were storage and combustion chambers that stored volatile chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened, the chemicals went from the storage chambers to combustion tube. And when he breathed this concoction out and they hit the oxygen, perhaps a flame went out of his mouth. It's just a theory. It's not there to test, study, and observe today. Oh, but wait a minute. The Bible also talks about fiery flying serpents. Fiery flying serpents? Now, this is a a painting from about 570 or so years ago of St. Michael and the angels fighting what they call the wyvern, which was a large reptilian creature with long, leathery wings. This is the, excuse me, the Pteranodon. He was a large reptilian creature with long, leathery wings. Notice a huge crest coming out the back of his head. It was filled with a complex series of passages, tubes, and chambers. We don't know what it was for today, but perhaps these were storage and combustion chambers. It stored volatile chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened, he breathed these out, and when they hit the oxygen, perhaps we had a fiery flying serpent. It's just a theory. We can't test study and observe it today. I live in northern Arizona, Stoneman Lake. Now, just north of Stoneman Lake is the Wapaki National Monument of Native American Ruins. And on the Wapaki is this cave drawing of a fire-breathing creature. We're told it was made 1,100 years ago. Notice a huge crest coming off the top of its head. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe, like the Word of God says, in the overwhelming historical and archaeological evidence attests that man and fire-breathing creatures lived together sometime in the past? How many of you can believe that? Absolutely. And this morning, I'm not here to get you to believe that man and dinosaurs lived together, even though they did. I'm not here to get you to believe that man and fire-breathing creatures lived together, even though they did. My point is this. No matter what God's Word has to say, no matter how difficult it might be for our finite little minds to understand the abilities of the Creator of the universe, if God's Word says it, you can put your faith in it word for word and cover to cover, my friends, Word for word and cover to cover. Hey, do you think it was terrifying to live with dinosaurs? 
You think they just considered us fast food? <laughs> Maybe not quite fast enough food? Well, the answer is no. Dinosaurs didn't eat people in the original creation. Now, you might be thinking, how in the world could you know that? Well, the Bible tells us. See, to every beast, God has given every green herb for meat. Remember, in the original creation, there was no death. There was no suffering. Plants were made to be the food source. I've had people say, that means plants were dying. Plants don't have a, a, a nephesh kaya, a living soul. They were made to be the food source. It wasn't until Noah and his family got off the ark, God said, every moving thing shall be meat for you. So it's okay to kill and eat meat today if you receive it with thanks to your biblical creator. But it wasn't an okay until they got off the ark. I, I imagine once sin corrupted the creation, things changed greatly. But Jesus is going to give us a new heavens and a new earth in the nearing future where there will be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears. We're going to go back to that perfect creation yet again. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be beyond human comprehension. The Bible says that. It says if we started throwing out ideas about how awesome heaven's going to be, the Bible says it's beyond anything you can even imagine. We don't want to miss it, and we don't want anyone else to miss it either. And God doesn't want anyone to miss it. It's the reason he's given us our marching orders, right? Pray continually. Spread the word and contend for the faith. Those are our marching orders, right? Hmm. Anyways, I tell people, if you like eating chicken or halibut steaks, or if you like deer hunting with your dad, you need to get it in now, because it's not going to be that way in the new heavens and the new earth. <laughs> so what in the world made dinosaurs go extinct? Well, you know, there's thousands of theories. They've all been pretty well debunked, including the meteorite theory. There's really not much evidence to support that. I have a, a, a theory that is supported all over the globe. I think that God judged man's sin with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, laying down the sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density around the globe, filled with the fossil record we have today, including the dinosaurs. The handful that were on the ark, there were only about 70 or so, 70 to 80 kinds of dinosaurs, two of each kind. Remember, you know, the largest dinosaur was a seropod. I'm going to suppose that God probably brought young ones, maybe the size of a small elephant. That was probably the largest animal on board the ark. Getting them on the ark was not a problem. And they did very well for about two to 3,000 years after the flood, but because of loss of habitat and competition with mankind, they slowly went extinct, pretty much disappearing about 1,000 to 1,200 years ago, even though Marco Polo wrote of them in China 750 or so years ago. Yet tonight... <clears throat> Millions of kids around the world, just before they fall asleep, the last thing they're going to hear is 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct, putting death before Adam. Satan's seed is being planted. And the enemy that sowed the lies is the devil. And the harvest will be the end of the world. Think about this from Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, Move with fear, respect to the word of God, and prepared an ark to the saving of his house and became the heir of righteousness, which is by what? Faith. We're supposed to have what? Faith. Faith in the word of God, word for word and cover to cover. Think of Noah's position. He lived in a world where it probably hadn't even rained. And God tells him to drop his career, his hobbies, everything he's doing and spend the rest of his life preparing this huge ark because there's going to be a global flood. And that's exactly what he and his family did through faith in the word of God and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And they went in as God had commanded, and the Lord shut them in. Now, up until that moment, that door shut, Anyone in the world could have walked up that one narrow plankway through that one and only door into God's one and only plan of salvation from that coming flood. One way, God's way. And only eight people. I've seen estimates from 100 million to a billion people. Only eight people put their faith in the non-compromised word of God. And became the heir of righteousness by faith. God shut the door and the global flood erupted as the fountains of the deep erupted. Most of the water came from below. A little came from above, most from below. So the fountains of the deep erupted. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew that 
uh, before the flood, people were eating and drinking, they were getting married, they were buying and selling, they were just carrying on their normal lives right up until the day Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And he warns, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus says his return will be in a time like the days of Noah, where people are buying, selling, trading, getting married, having beer parties, celebrating football games, ignoring the Word of God, scoffing at believers. And that's when Jesus is going to return. I suspect it'll be sooner as opposed to later. Because I say we are living in the days of Noah yet again. The calling of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues, to expose false anti-biblical teachings in order to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. I used to be a theistic evolutionist. Today, the church is full of theistic evolutionists, progressive creationists, gap theorists. Sometimes they say, man, how many Jesus died on that cross? Because only one I've ever read in the Bible, created in six days, rested on the seventh, and judged the world with a flood that covered all the high hills under heaven. It's the only one found in the Word of God, my friends. All the others were invented to fit old earth pagan beliefs into God's Word. So let me end with this. From the book of John, we're told, In the beginning was the Word, and all things were made by the Word of God. So the Word of God is our Creator. Do you see that? The Creator is the Word of God. And we're told the Word, our Creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Our Creator is who? When you deny the Creator, who are you denying? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our Creator is Jesus Christ. Now Jesus, who is the Creator and the Word of God, He also called Himself the bread of life. So He's the Word and the bread of life. But when tempted by Satan, Jesus told Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. My friends, that means word for word and cover to cover. And that includes the first five words of the Bible, which read, in the beginning... God created. My friends, you can believe those first five words and every word thereafter, word for word and cover to cover. Put your faith in the Word of God. This has been What Happened to the Dinosaurs, presented by Russ Miller. To receive a free catalog of hundreds of awesome Bible studies on DVD video and audio CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, Information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or visit us on the web at compass.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook. Search facebook.com slash compassbible.